Are massive home heating bills keeping you up at night? <sighs> There's got to be a better way. Well, today is your lucky day. What if I told you that there is a heating technology 500% more efficient than what you've got in your house today? Now, if you're one of those people who are thinking, doesn't that break the laws of thermodynamics? Don't you worry about the unwavering laws of thermodynamics. Let me worry about blank. Ah, the heat pump. Hardly new, the technology goes back decades. So are heat pumps all they're cracked up to be? And what about the crazy claim of being 500% efficient? Well, I thought that deserved a deeper dive here on Tupa Da Vinci. To answer this question, we need to break this down into a few categories, starting with the laws of thermodynamics and what efficiency really means. Thermodynamics is a study of energy, how it's transferred and by extension, the relationship between all forms of energy. The three laws of thermodynamics are as follows. The law of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Energy can only be transferred or changed from one form to another. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of any isolated system always increases. Entropy can best be understood as randomness. You can clean your house and tidy up. This is a state of low entropy and nature much prefers randomness. Just wait a few days and suddenly it's as if little messy gnomes have gone and made a mess of things. The third law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a system approaches a constant value as the temperature approaches absolute zero. We'll just brush over this one and we're not gonna talk about it a whole lot in this video. At its core, when you put up walls in a roof, your end game is to make a conditioned space that has a temperature difference to its surroundings. In the dead of winter, it might be freezing out, but you want to maintain 70 degrees inside. Remember, there is no such thing as cold, only the absence of heat. Doesn't Master Uguay in Kung Fu Panda say that somewhere? I don't think so, Ricky. Pretty sure he does. Inversely, in the summer, you strive for something close to 7 degrees inside, even while it's 100 degrees outside. Well, the minute you go and make this your goal, you're kind of messing with entropy. In thermodynamics, heat flows from regions of high concentration to regions of low. So your warm house on a winter day is slowly losing heat to the outside. You can try to slow this down with insulation, but try as you might, your home is still gonna lose heat to the outside. Well, that's no good. I mean, being comfortable is like the highest ideal of human life. Well, that and cat videos on YouTube and food photos on Instagram, sorry, the gram. This is a resistive heater. It takes electricity and converts it into heat energy. Because remember the first rule of thermodynamics is that you can't create energy, only convert it. A resistive heater like this one is actually really efficient, like over 90%. If you took one apart, you'd notice that metal coils glow and emit light, a form of energy that isn't providing heat and thus not 100% efficient. Really in our world, there is no such thing as 100% efficiency. A gas car is between 25 and 40% efficient. This means that each gallon of gas you burn, over 60% of it is wasted as heat and sound and stuff that isn't moving you forward move over to an electric vehicle, and that efficiency is improved greatly to over 80 to 90%. So if a space heater is like 90% efficient, how the heck can a heat pump be 500% efficient? That literally breaks the first rule of thermodynamics, right? So a heat pump does produce about five times as much heat with the same amount of electrical energy as a resistive space heater. How does it do this? Well, that's where your decision to watch this video is rewarded with a conversation about the refrigeration cycle. Yay, science, come on. This is gonna be good. So, two common heat pump systems you have in your house right now is your air conditioning system and your refrigerator. Remember when I said that there's no such thing as cold, only the absence of heat. So what the heck is your air conditioning doing? Well, it is not converting energy at all. It's doing something far more sinister. Okay, I don't know why I said that. It's not sinister. It's simply moving heat from one place to another. So bad news, anyone whose answer to climate change was to run the AC all day with the windows and doors open, that's not gonna work because the AC is just taking heat energy from inside your house and pumping it outside. In the refrigeration cycle, there are a few things we need to have. First, you need a working fluid, something that has some advantageous properties. We use refrigerant since 1990, something like the hydrofluorocarbon R134A, a fluid whose boiling point can be manipulated. Stick a thermometer in a pot of boiling water and you'll see something interesting. The temperature rises until the water reaches its boiling point. At sea level, that's 100 degrees centigrade or 212 Fahrenheit. After that, the water stops heating up. That's because all the energy provided by your stove is no longer heating up the liquid, but it is helping to break the bonds and turn it into a gas. This is known as the latent heat of vaporization. This is very energy intensive and that's why it might be hours until the water entirely boils off. 
Only then will the steam be able to continue to get hotter. What's interesting is if you put that same pot in a vacuum, meaning you sucked out all the air pressure, that pot would actually begin to boil at room temperature. Does that mean water in a vacuum gets really hot? Not at all. It means that the boiling point of a liquid is actually a function of its pressure. Just imagine all those air molecules in the atmosphere kind of pushing down on the water. The minute you remove it, it suddenly becomes far easier for the water to evaporate and turn into a gas. The opposite is actually how a pressure cooker works. By trapping the evaporating steam and not letting it out, the pressure inside the cooker increases dramatically over one atmosphere, the pressure we would normally see. By doing so, the boiling point of water is maybe 110 degrees or 120 degrees, and that extra temperature means your food cooks faster. So the boiling point of a fluid is actually a function of pressure. Okay, so now that we know that, what if we change the pressure of our refrigerant to really high pressure and really low pressure to take advantage of this? Welcome to the refrigeration cycle. So now we're gonna need a compressor, that big loud thing you hear whenever your fridge and AC kicks on. The compressor compresses the refrigerant to a much higher pressure, temperature, and comes out as a vapor. We could then run this hot compressed fluid through a heat exchanger, which is basically a mechanical system designed to maximize surface area of heat transfer via convection, the transfer of heat from solid to air. Think of like a heat sink on your computer case, or anytime you ever see fins like on a radiator on a car, those are all heat exchangers built to have maximum airflow to take out the heat from the system. If we use metals with really good heat transfer properties like aluminum or copper, then the heat from the fluid passes through a long series of coils with fins on it, which heat up the metal heat sink, and then a fan blowing air over these fins will be blowing hot air into the space. There are two parts, the condenser and the evaporator. Remembering that making a fluid evaporate requires energy input, the evaporator is the side that blows out cool air. That's because a low pressure, largely liquid fluid comes in. And because of its low pressure, it readily boils, absorbing lots of energy, thus cooling that area. The condenser is where the fluid comes in a high pressure, high heat vapor. And as heat is extracted by the heat exchanger, the vapor begins to condense and inversely puts out large amounts of heat to turn into a liquid. So the compressor increases pressure and this metering device, also able to work in both directions, acts as an expansion valve, greatly reducing the pressure of the fluid. So by manipulating the pressure of the refrigerant, we can have the fluid condense to a liquid or evaporate to a gas to either absorb heat and then release heat. Pretty cool, right? So if you have a split AC system, your evaporator is on the inside blowing cool air and the condenser is on the outside discharging hot air. So heat pump is basically just your AC system, except now it can be reversed. Evaporator can become condenser and the condenser can become the evaporator. With a switching valve, the refrigerant from the compressor can be routed in both directions, allowing it to heat or cool your house. So while many people in Europe and Asia have these combo AC and heat pump systems, they're not quite so popular yet here in the US. Why is that? They're 500% efficient after all. Okay, so about that. That's not exactly true. To be more specific, the efficiency of a heat pump is dependent on the temperature difference between the two spaces. For the ideal 500% number, the temperature difference has to be less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees centigrade. So that gets you to your first problem. How can you suck out heat from outside to pump it inside when it's really cold outside? Well, if it's freezing out, it's zero degrees centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the absolute temperature scale, Kelvin, that's actually 273.15 degrees Kelvin, meaning that the point where there is no heat energy at all is negative 273 degrees centigrade. So yeah, even if it was negative 40 degrees out, there is still heat energy that can be extracted. Just note that the efficiency drops the colder it gets. So we have to introduce new terms now. The coefficient of performance. We can't say the heat pump is 500% efficient because that pesky law of thermodynamics. You know, it's not possible. Instead, we could say the heat pump can have a potential coefficient of performance of five or 500%. This means that if I use one kilowatt hour of electricity, I can bring five kilowatt hours of heat energy into my room from the outside. Remember, heat pumps do not make heat, only move it. And that, my dear Watson, is why a heat pump does have a COP of five, while not breaking the laws of thermodynamics. Fun fact, did you know that taking two seconds to hit that like button can actually save you 15% off on your home heating bills? No, it won't. What? No, it won't. Now, 
It's not all unicorns and rainbows. The coefficient of performance is going to drop the colder it gets. A heat pump is a no-brainer here in San Diego because the coldest it ever gets here is above freezing. But if you live in a very harsh climate, there are some things you need to know. First of all, the coils on the outside unit get really cold and will eventually start to form ice. The formation of ice is bad for two reasons. First, the ice acts as an insulator, reducing the heat transfer from the metal fins to the air lowering performance. Also, as the ice thickens, it lowers the flow of air between the fins until eventually it's totally frozen over and no air can pass over the fins. When this happens, most systems enter a thaw mode, where the heating to the home stops, and instead it flips the system around and blows hot air over the outside system to thaw out the ice. So you will not be getting heat during this time, and you'll be using electricity while not getting any benefit. So in a really cold condition, you might be getting closer to one or two times the performance, not the five you would have gotten, but still good. Depending on where you live and the system that you have, some heat pump systems have a resistive heating system that will trigger on when it is in thawing mode. This way you continue to receive heat just at a more expensive rate until once the outside unit is thawed out, then it turns back into being a heat pump. There's one more optimization we can make, and that is moving to a geothermal heat pump. Geothermal sounds complicated, it just means geo-earth and thermal heat. So even if it was negative 20 degrees outside, it turns out that if you dig a few feet into the ground, the temperature is usually pretty constant. Based on where you live, 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ground is such a massive heat reservoir that if you put your heating or cooling coals underground a few feet, you could greatly improve the performance of your system in very cold temperatures. But just remember, even in sub-freezing temperatures, heat pumps can totally still work. Heat pumps are better than resistive heating, but what about like a natural gas furnace? This is where things get interesting, and we start to see why heat pumps aren't more popular here in the US. So a natural gas furnace is also pretty efficient, around 70%. Not as good as the electric heater because some of the gas invariably will be exhausted, unburnt, or partially burnt. But at this point, we need to bring up one more variable, the cost. Natural gas is typically built in therms here in the US which is a unit that stands for 100,000 BTU or British thermal units. So 100 cubic feet of natural gas has about 100,000 BTUs of energy or one therm. It's complicated, but just bear with me. Average prices per therm range between 50 cents to a dollar. But if you convert one therm into kilowatt hours, you'll see that one therm is the equivalent of about 29.3 kilowatt hours of electricity. So looking at a state like Idaho, where natural gas is dirt cheap, you can see that converting natural gas to kilowatt hours means that it's about five times as cheap as electricity is per kilowatt hour. And this is the crux of why most homes in the US that have gas hookups use gas furnaces to heat. It's just so cheap. And even though the heat pump is more efficient, it might still be cheaper to operate something like a gas furnace. Now, there are some changes on the horizon. For instance, lots of new home construction is opting not to run a natural gas line because it does add a lot of cost to construction. If you remember what happened in Texas in February during a tragically cold winter, large parts of the state were left without electricity. So you might think it wise to also have natural gas as a backup option. And I think I agree with you on that. But if you don't have electricity, even with natural gas, you can't power the blowers to move the air and actually provide heat to your home. If you have a natural gas or wood burning fireplace, you might be able to bring in some warmth. But there are a lot of moving parts here. And maybe if you guys leave me a comment, I can cover some more of the trends and where things are headed in a future video. So let's recap. A heat pump doesn't actually generate heat. A resistive electric heater or a natural gas furnace does. It converts electrical energy in the case of the resistive heater into heat energy or chemical energy in the form of natural gas into heat in the case of the gas furnace. Unlike these two types of systems, a heat pump does not create heat. It only pumps heat from one place to another. And it is this reason that makes it able to move up to five times more heat energy per kilowatt hour than other types. So it's not 500% efficient, but it does have a coefficient of performance of five. Heat pumps are making big inroads in home heating even in the US and even in high efficiency vehicles like electric cars. In fact, new Tesla models have ditched the resistive heating they used to have, opting instead for heat pumps. So let's have a round of applause for the heat pump. Truly one of mankind's greatest achievements because without it, there's no Phoenix, Arizona or Las Vegas. We couldn't keep our food cold for weeks and our sodas and beer would be warm. Wow, that's a depressing thought. So thank you, heat pumps, for all you do. All right, so that is the look at heat pumps and why they are seriously really quite efficient in terms of 
heating up spaces and why they don't actually break any laws of thermodynamics. Big shout out to all of you guys for watching this video all the way through, especially to all of our patrons on Patreon and all of our YouTube members. You guys' support is what makes this show possible and keeps us independent. So if you want to see more videos like this, maybe even allow me to do this full time one day, consider joining us on Patreon or as a YouTube channel member. So take a look around. We have some other really cool videos. Recently, we talked about why the Starship from SpaceX is so big. We have a bunch of other stuff that I think you'll like as well. So take a look around the channel. And until next time, I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci.